Uh, today, let's turn over to, uh, in fact, where were we in our scripture reading? Because that last verse was, look, let's go there, Luke 6, 26, because the last verse actually is kind of my sermon. It's weird how the Lord, he woke me up all through the night. Uh, and I kept thinking about this sermon because I was, I, I don't know if I was struggling to preach it or not, but he just kept confirming all night long. The Lord kept waking me up and the kids can go ahead and be dismissed. I think with school coming and everybody going off their separate ways, for those that are in college, you're going to be meeting new people along the way. Uh, and it's important. I believe this is a really, really important subject. Uh, for everyday life, because we meet people all the time, and you never know who's going to come into our lives. Uh, for you teachers out there, you meet new students, and you get you meet their parents, and sometimes teachers can get friendly and hooked up with and create a friend network uh, and have uh, people that they interact with all the time. But my message today is, as Christians, we need to be careful who we keep company with. Uh, and today it's my message on is on keeping good company, keeping good company. And again, after this service, I know as we head into August here, that's the month where all the students go back to college and many won't be coming to church because they'll be away at school. Um, it's important, especially when you're in college, you get that friend network and sometime that friend network in college lasts you the rest of your life. Sometime that friend network in high school, you keep those bonds and you keep those bonds for the rest of your life. But sometimes bonds can be really good and they can help you. And at other times, bonds can actually be detrimental to you. Bonds with friends. Uh, so be wise, be wise who you, who you pal around with. And in the end, know this, that you can be uplifted by good friends. And at the same time, when you get friends that aren't so good, they can really drag you down. And how many people in life have gone to early deaths because they got around the wrong, the wrong people? And Donnie, as a police officer, you probably have seen that over and over again, uh, where a good kid ends up coming to a premature death because they got around the wrong people. You know, be very careful and do it prayerfully. And again, it's God wants to hear that when you meet somebody. Hey, I really like this person. I have a good relationship with this person, a friend relationship. And maybe the Lord is working on you to say, get away from that network of friends. Just not good for you. You can't do everything I want you to do when you're associated with them. Remember this. It's not your friends that the ones that should be leading you especially in the ways of righteousness. You should be leading them. And when you talk about the Lord, that's the telltale sign. How do they react? Truthfully, if I'm around somebody long enough and they won't let me talk about Christ and they don't want to hear it, I'm going to cut that relationship off simply because I can't be myself. As a Christian, Christ is part of us, is he not? And if you can't talk openly about the Lord and a person that you're friends with just doesn't want to hear it, it's just best to say, we've come to a parting of the ways. Kind of like Billy Sunday, one of the, a very good baseball player, Chicago White Sox, became one of the greatest preachers America has ever seen. And he told his friends one day, his fellow ball players, he said, we've come, fellas, we've come to the parting of the ways. He said, that's where I'm going. And this is where you guys are going. We've parted company. And Billy Sunday became a great, great evangelist. And I don't know what, what happened to the rest of them, whether they got saved or not. But he decided their company was just not going to help him serve the Lord. And that's what you need to do in life. And you need to judge your friends by what I just said. Because you won't come to fruition for the Lord if you can't do that. Let's go to that uh, uh, reading today, Luke chapter 6, and I believe that was what, verse 20, 26? Yeah. 
wait, what was it? Luke. Luke 6, verse 26. Okay, let's look at that verse. Woe unto you. When all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. And it says in verse 22, this whole, the whole context here is about friendship and about men hating you or separating you from their company and not liking you for who you are. Verse 22, blessed are ye when men shall hate you. I mean, really, who wants to be hated? But if they're hating you for a godly cause, you're blessed. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. If somebody will do that, they're truly not your friend. Truly not your friend. And you don't need to bow to them and say, okay, I won't talk about it anymore. I'll keep Christ's name out of our conversation. No, no. Christ comes first. Christ comes first. Now, there was a great king in the Old Testament. He was a great king. He was a good king. And his name is Jehoshaphat. He was a good king. And the Lord spoke very highly of him. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But there was one little problem. One little problem with Jehoshaphat. He kept company with evil people. He kept company with evil people. Okay, let's take a look at him. Let's go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20, look at verse 31. And Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 30 and five years old when he began to reign. So he was middle-aged, basically. And he reigned 20 and five years in Jerusalem. And his mother name, mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in the way of Asa, his father, and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So praise the Lord, he was a good king. Howbeit, the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. Okay, now look, verse 35. And after this, did Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. Got a righteous man joining himself with a wicked man. Okay, interesting stuff here. It says in 36, and he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And made, they made the ships in Easy and Geber. Then Eliezer, the son of Dodava of Marisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works. And the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Did God honor that, that union? No, he didn't. And God said, oh, a righteous king, getting together with a wicked king, for the purpose of making ships. The Lord said, no, I'm not going to honor that. He sent a prophet and said, it's not going to prosper. And those ships were broken. This is a real nice, if you spiritualize this, you say, okay, you got someone that's saved. And they join themselves to friendships with people that aren't. Is it going to work? Who's going to uplift and who's going to drag down? And isn't that a lot like a marriage? When the Lord says, be you not unequally yoked together. How many businesses have been started with Christians and the unsaved? And I know one where a Christian man joined in with an unsaved man and lost his shirt. He lost a whole bunch because he joined in with the wicked man, an unsaved man. And I say man wasn't openly wicked, but he's an unbeliever. He joined in with them, and the business relationship did not prosper. And I believe this. God will prosper you when you do the right thing. 
And when you do the wrong thing, like in this case, the Lord said, no, nope, not going to prosper that. And Lord made it clear. Those ships were broken because of that relationship, wasn't it? Was Jehoshaphat a good king? But did he always make good decisions? Our head, as my dad always used to tell me, Kevin, your head shakes both ways. It shakes both ways. <laughs> Let's go to Second Kings. He was such a godly king that the prophet Elisha actually said, I regard his presence. But yet, yet this, great men are what? Come on, one of, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Great men are not always wise. Great men are not always wise. Second Kings chapter 3. Look in verse number 11. Second Kings. Chapter 3, verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel, Israel's servants, answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So he had spiritual discernment. He knew the word of the Lord was with Elisha. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, Look what he tells him. As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. He said, you're so wicked. I don't even want to talk to you. But basically he said, because I, I regard Jehoshaphat and his presence, I'll speak. That's a godly king, isn't it? That that prophet would say, because he's here. Have you ever been in the, in the presence of somebody really godly? And you feel that? And you say, that person is godly. Was Elisha a great prophet? Did he have spiritual discernment? He was able to say, that Jehoshaphat, I regard his presence. That's a godly man. But again, he stumbled with friendship. He liked to be around friends that were wicked. I don't get it. And I don't get how Christians can pal around with people that are wicked all the time, just Go with them. Wicked works, wicked acts, wicked mouths. And just, that's my buddy. I don't get that. Doesn't iron sharpen iron? So a man sharpeneth what? The countenance of his friends. Get around people who are going to sharpen you. Spiritually, sharpen you. Make me sharp. They talk right, they act right, they love God. That's uplifting. Why would I want to be around somebody that's going to drag me down all the time? <clears throat> Let's keep going. Let's look at another thing with Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles. Found these things to be rather amazing when I was looking at them yesterday. Second Chronicles chapter 19. <clears throat> another case with him. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles 19, verse 1. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani. No, Tommy, this isn't your Jehu. <clears throat> this isn't King Jehu. This is the prophet. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Here we go again, right? Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Okay? He said, 
Should the righteous be in alignment, be an ally to the wicked? Should it help the wicked, the ungodly? He said, what are you doing? But nevertheless, there are good things in you. Again, here's a righteous king who's having trouble with palling around with ungodly people. Now, think about life. We have to rub shoulders with the unbelievers. Didn't Paul say that he walked in the world? He said he couldn't go out of the world. He was in the world, but he wasn't of the world. And I believe Paul's relationship with the unbelievers was basically at arm's length, cautious. He didn't get too involved with unbelievers. Paul was all about supporting the churches and all about Christians and the work of the Lord. He knew if I get involved with the ungodly, it's going to drag me down. Okay, let's take a little bit more here. What will wicked people do when you're around them? And let's talk about this. The righteous and the wicked. Who will rub off more on who? And in the end, don't you have to compromise? When God called Israel out of Egypt, what did Pharaoh try to do? He tried about three or four times to make compromise. He said, you can go, but just don't go too far. You can go, but leave your kids and your, your cattle behind. You can go, but not completely. What did God want? He wanted them out. Get away from that. Did he not say twice in the Bible? Out of Egypt? Have I called my son? When they were out of Egypt, didn't God open the Red Sea? Make a way. While the Red Sea was open, it still connected Egypt with them, didn't it? There was still that land bridge. It still connected them to Egypt. But what happened? After they got across, what did God do? He brought the water back. Thus, making a line of distinction there that they could never cross to go back to the land that they once came out of. God said, I want you separated. And how important is that in our life? Now, some Christians think it's really important. And others, they don't think it important at all. Are you that Jehoshaphat? He's good, but he's a great king and a godly king, but he aligns himself with wicked people. Okay, let's keep looking at this. What will the wicked do? Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Now you say, but I have friends, Pastor, and, and I witness to them all the time. And they listen to me. Hey, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's the way it should be. When the demoniac got saved, when he came to Christ and the Lord cleaned him up and the Bible says he was clothed, sitting in his right mind at the feet of Jesus, what did the Lord command him to do? The Lord said to him, go return. In the book of Luke, it says, go return to your own house and show great things what God has done with you, done for you. But in the other passage in the book of Mark, it says to him, the Lord said, go and tell your friends. Go and tell your friend the wonderful things that God has done for you. Now, there we go. These friends that you have, are you willing to witness to them? Do you witness to them? And do they know you're a Christian? And are they good with that? Or do they push that Christianity that you tried to bring to them? Do they, do they quench it and try to put out the fire that you have? That's the thing. And that's where prayer about these things and asking the Lord, should I keep company with these people? Help me, Lord, to find a good friendship and network, a group of friends that are righteous, who are going to lift me up, not pull me down. 
Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10. It says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Now, that, this is instruction for all people. And as I said, Donnie being a police officer, he's seen this many times where good young people get around the wrong people. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up. Alive is the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk thou not in the way with them. Refrain from the, thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil. And make haste <clears throat> to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay, they lay wait. For their own blood, they lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. This is making alignment with someone who's wicked. And if they entice you to do it, don't consent to it. And I tell you, these are really good words for kids, for especially those that are entering into their teenage years, and those in high school, and those that are around other people. That'll try to convince them to do certain things. If my son, and this could be to, you know, to all kids, my kids, basically, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Get away from them. And parents, that's what you ought to really instill in your kids. They could get in a car one evening and be the innocent victim in an accident full of drunk drivers or something like that. Get into that car or get stuck on some type of drug because they got around the wrong people. You know how this stuff works. And the Lord tells us, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Just say no. Just say no. My duty as a preacher is not just to get you to the other side to get you rewarded. My duty as a preacher is to warn you so you don't die a premature death. This is to wise people I speak. And weren't these same words said to wise people? Let's go up just a couple of verses before that verse. My son of sinners entice thee. Look what happens. Verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Am I not trying to give you wisdom? Am I not trying to give you instruction? Your preacher is. Have your parents. Have your parents. Because look in the next verse. And I don't speak this just to our children here. But I speak this in regard to myself as I grew up. Did my parents. For those that are older here. Did your parents help you to stay out of trouble? Well, praise the Lord. Did your preacher help you to stay out of trouble? Praise the Lord. Did you hear the instruction? Can you go back at times in your life and say, I didn't get in that car because I know what my parents told me. I didn't smoke that drug. I didn't smoke that cigarette. I didn't do that with the group because I knew my parents said no. I knew before the eyes of the Lord. I knew that my preacher had warned me. Don't go with that. I stayed around that guy, or I got away from that guy. I got away from that woman, or that girl, back in high school, because the instruction I was given. That instruction is instruction of wisdom. But how many young people don't want the preacher to tell them? Listen. Doesn't God speak through the preacher? And in all seriousness, haven't I experienced these things myself? And can't the instruction that I give you from the word of God save your life?
My goal is not just for you to get up there rewarded. But my goal is that you'll live a long life here on earth. A long, fulfilling, happy life. And one that you can look back over. Listen, this is, I'm telling you, it's my goal as a pastor. I want everybody in this church to be able to look over their life and say, I did it. I served God. I made it. As Paul said, I finished my course. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear. Don't we have two ears? How many times did Jesus say, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He never said, he that hath eyes to see, let him see. He didn't say, he that hath a tongue to talk, let him talk. He that hath ears to hear. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. And then it gets into, my son of sinners entice thee, consent thou not, with the understanding that your parents have already told you these things. Okay? God's instruction to Israel, let's go back to Deuteronomy 7, when they came into the promised land, the Lord told them, be careful. Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites, and the Amorites and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou mar make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou make unto thy son. Why? Why was God so adamant about this? Why did God say that? What was wrong with this? What was wrong with it? Why couldn't they take their son? Why, she's a beautiful woman. Look at her. He loves her. Why can't he marry her? What was the problem? Was it not that she wasn't attractive? Was it not that she wasn't a nice person? What was the problem? And this is what happens with Christian kids. They see somebody fall in love with them. And they don't think. And love can do that. They don't realize they're entering into a covenant with somebody who is not on the same spiritual plane. And this was the whole thing. It wasn't about fleshly things. It was about spirituality. Because the Lord told them in the next verse. For they will. I mean, it wasn't even a matter. They might. He said they will. For they will turn away thy son from following me. Come on. Can I get an amen? Because how many young people are going to go out or are thinking about going out or might one day marry somebody who's not saved? What does God say? You say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I'm in love with them. What does God say? Nobody wants to start out on the wrong foot, do they? For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. And the reason is because you're a holy person and God doesn't want the holy to mingle with the unholy. 
Can I get an amen? Because it's very quiet in here. God says you're holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. If this person's not saved, they are unholy. Why would a holy person want to be mingled with an unholy person? Why? Do you love God? And if you love that person, you ought to be in prayer constantly. Constantly. Lord, save them. And do everything you can to bring them to Christ. To do the right thing. I was studying yesterday, and I got three things from one of the expositors that I was reading. Friendship with the wrong people is a real dangerous social temptation. That's what he said. He said, and this, this is somebody who's an older expositor. So in his day, he knew. Friendship with the wrong people it's a real dangerous social temptation. And boy, is it ever a temptation. You get around someone who's rich, and you get that temptation, they want to befriend me. And oh, they got so much. Or you get around somebody who has that persuasive personality, and they want to befriend you, and you say, oh, they're just so kind and so nice. It's a real dangerous social temptation. And it often involves an immense sacrifice of Christian values and principles. Friendship with the wrong people often involves an immense sacrifice of Christian values and principles, meaning you can't be who you are. And what should we be? Aren't we supposed to be lights for the Lord? Isn't the devil trying to put the light out? I tell you, when I get around Christians, my light shines brighter. Let me say it again. When I get around Christians, my light shines brighter. And when I get around the lost, my light tends to go out a little bit. And finally, it's in direct violation. Friendship with the wrong people is in direct violation of the scripture. Let's look at two passages. Let's go to Proverbs 22 and James 4. Proverbs chapter 22 and James 4. Proverbs chapter 22 and James 4. Now, I'm not telling you, and I don't want this to be misinterpreted, I'm not telling you you can't have friends that are lost. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying to you is, if your friends are dragging you down spiritually, it's time to get away from them. That's what I'm saying. Let me be clear. Proverbs chapter 22, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are shorties for debts. Okay, so it tells you there, be careful, be careful. Okay, let's go to James chapter four. James chapter four. <laughs> And then I'm going to tell you something that really hit me yesterday, too. And I was like, wow, that was an aha moment I had yesterday. James chapter 4, James 4 and verse 4. It says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Again, I didn't write the scripture, but the Lord says, be careful who you make friends with. Okay, now, the aha, aha moment that I had yesterday is, 
friendship with the wrong people, friendship with the wrong people played a role in the death of our Savior. Friendship and rubbing shoulders or elbows with the wrong people played a role in the death of Christ. This is how far this thing can go. Okay? What happened to Judas? What happened to him? Was he not in a good fold? Was he not around the Savior? Was he not around the apostles? How can you get any closer to God, huh? What happened? What happened? He left them, didn't he? He left them. He went out when it was dark. And guess what he did? He went to others that he was palling around with. And they said, oh, you're one of them. Did it make him any better? He said, and deep in their heart, they were glad. They got one from the inside. Our treacherous plan will work. We've got one. We've got a defector. Hey, what will you give me? What will you give me? And I'll, I'll give him for it. I'll, I'll be trampled. So they worked up a deal, didn't they? Did it make him any better? And guess what happened in the garden? He comes with officers and soldiers, doesn't he? And he says, the one that I kiss, it's him. That's the one. So he went up to Jesus and he said the famous words, come on. What do you say to Jesus? He said to Jesus, what do you say to Jesus? Hell master. And he kissed him. What does Jesus say to him? Friend. 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 You better watch your friends. Because I tell you right now, they don't, the ones that are wicked, the ones that are unbelievers, they don't care about the Savior like you do. They don't. And Jesus says to him, friend, and that's enough language right there. Look them in the eye. Friend, and they were close because he had just kissed Jesus. And it was dark. Friend, imagine the eyes of God. Friend, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Then they took him to Pilate, didn't they? What happened there? He took him three times in the judgment, didn't he? And he brought him, he says, I find no fault in this man. And then the second time, I find no fault in this man. He deserves to die because he made himself a king. He called himself the son of God. Pilate takes him back in and he says, whence art thou? Basically, where are you from? Who are you? Jesus didn't say a word. Brought him out again. He says, I bring him out again the third time. I find no fault in him. Ah, one ace left, right? One ace card they had left. 
when all else fails. We'll raise the what card? The friend card. Hey, pilot, who are your friends? Hey, pilot, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Friendship of the world is what? Enmity with God. Who are your friends? And are they good friends? Do they pull you down? This message is for everybody in here as we go through life to understand our network of friends can either take and elevate us closer to God or our network of friends can pull us away. If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. And what did he do? What did he do? Whose friend did he rather be? He could have said, I'd rather be a friend to this man. <laughs> but he didn't. He said, have it your way. Crucify him. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. See, the whole thing is, it's a matter of friendship. Yes, it's good. Friendship, it's great to have friends. I praise God for the friends that I have. I praise God that if I, if some friends I have, uh, friends I have, I could call at three in the morning and say, I need your help, and they would be there. I praise God for the network of friends that I have. But we need to be careful that our friends are not ungodly. Our friends are not unholy. We need to be careful. And finally, in closing, hold the applause. This is a tough audience today. Everybody's so quiet. I don't know if, what's this message doing to you? I don't know. I know what it did to me. And I don't know what it's doing to you. You might walk out of here and say, oh, man. That was the most miserable, depressing sermon I ever heard in my life. Or you'll walk out of here and say, I got some work to do with my friend network. Or you'll walk out of here and say, in one ear, out the other. But I hope it goes in the ear, to the middle, and then straight down to the heart. I hope. In closing, Proverbs chapter 13. This is a great, great verse. And one that I think everyone, I'm not... a if you don't like writing your Bible, but boy, this is a good one to highlight. To highlight. And I guess I'm going to ask this before I read it. And who in here believes this book? Come on, who in here believes this book? Who in here believes God gave us this book? And this is the word of God. Okay, who believes that? And who believes that we're accountable to what we read in the book? And who believes when we go against the book that we're going to get judged for it? And that when we go against the book, bad things can happen. And who believes that we need to obey it? Okay. So, who believes that the message today came from the book? Okay. With that, let's look in Proverbs 13, verse 20. <clears throat> this is a great verse. We're going to close right after this. We're going to have, uh, where's Reed? I saw you today. Reed, you're going to close this in prayer after we're done here, if you don't mind. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Amen? Does that not sum it up? He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. To me, there's no greater verse that would conclude this message than that right there. That is a comparison contrast sermon. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And with that, our head shakes both ways.
Okay, Reed, you want to close this in a word of prayer? I'm going to let you pray into the mic here if you would. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for letting everybody be able to come out here and hear the message today. Lord, hopefully everybody takes to heart and really thinks about what they heard today. Uh, the summer closing, uh, anybody that's going back to school, give them the strength and the knowledge and preparation to be able to um, go to school and get right back into the groove of what they were doing. Um, continue to keep everybody safe and anybody that needs your healing hand, please give it to them, Lord. And most of all, we thank you for the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen.